So another another bass player. Oh my god, how many is this? It's not like it's not like we haven't had any guitarists. Yes, but <laughs> in the real world, there should be more guitarists generally than bass players. Is that is that that is true, isn't it? No, it's true that there are. It's not necessarily true that there should be. Well, because there could be two <laughs> guitarists for every one bass player. Yeah, there, I mean, there could be two bass players for every one guitarist. If you think, about what it. band is that? I'm never going to see them play. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter Hook. But it, what's funny, actually, I saw Peter Hook with his solo band. And um, what's funny was that um, he, so he had another bass player. So he's playing all his stuff, which, uh, so, no, yeah, so there's this bass player who's playing all of Hooky's lines, which are all right up the dusty end anyway. And then, which, so that, which frees Hooky up to go even further up the dusty end. <laughs> so you've got two bass players and still no bass happening at all. <laughs> Call for Guy Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. Uh, we've got another bass player coming on now, haven't we? So this is this is our moment. Uh, yes, we ha yeah we have a true trailblazing original. But but not just a bass player like Paul McCartney, a bass player songwriter. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, uh, that I I I don't think he gets the I don't think he quite gets the credit for that. For, no. You know, it's it's for a, certainly a an epoch making catalogue. Shall we say? Let's dig deep and find out. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good thing. at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Right, you there? Yay! Hey! <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I, had a, I had a last tinkle. <laughs> yeah. How are you I'm doing, a, Glenn? I'm doing all right, but we've only just started. Nice Rickenbacker there. There you go. Yeah, I thought I thought that actually did just happen to be there, but I sort of thought you'd probably like that. You you, you don't see many sunburst ones. No, this is a, it's actually called uh, Montezuma. This and it's a colour they only did in two thousand and three. I, I can only apologise. I, I, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, the thing... <laughs> see, no, like, I'm going to play the white man between you two. You're a guitarist. Guy's a bass player. Yeah. But look, look. This is my cross... What side. is that? That's Montezuma's Revenge. No, it's... Can you see it? <laughs> That's it, beautiful. A Hofner. It's, it's a Hofner president, and it's exactly what Tommy still played. Oh, there you uh, go. Well, the old time cave, well, I lived in a cave. I'll leave it at that. Because in fact, actually, uh, Glenn, the only, because uh, for those who don't know, which is probably all of you, my dad, Mike Pratt, co-wrote with Lionel Barr all of Tommy Steele's old songs. And the only time I've ever, ever performed one of them was with you, Glenn, I think, at a party of David Gilmore's in about yeah. 1988. Yeah, yeah which... With the caveman. And which was one of the most um, well-equipped gigs that I've ever done. I was sitting in with the pretty things. My one, own, actually, I did another gig with them, but they were mates of mine. They were short of a bass player. I did it. Where we playing? Dave Gilmore's house. Get there. And it wasn't just a marquee on the tennis court. It was a marquee on the tennis courts with an S on it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how do you ever off live, right? <laughs> lots, of, lots of pedals, effects, I, I, I can imagine, yeah. Well, the only, all the people that were there, it was like Eric Idle was there and all that lot. George Harrison was there. And he was going to get up and play with us, and then he realised he was too pissed. That's right. That's right. And I, I was gutted. I thought I was going to play with... I got berated by Rabbit Bundrick. He oh, because I was like, yeah, but he, who's who's Rabbit guy? Who was the Who's keyboard player? Uh, who's this big brawly Texan um, who just came? Yeah, we, we just I, I just got up because you asked me to. Did rock with the caveman, and then he just came over to me and went, "You're awful, you're terrible." <laughs> well, he, 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 he was probably right. <laughs> yeah, he probably was. I mean, I was pretty pissed. <laughs> rock, in the, rock in the caveman was actually officially the first rock and roll record ever made by an Englishman, wasn't it? Yeah, 1950, it was, yeah. 1956. Ronnie Scott played the sax solo. Ronnie Scott played the sax solo. I don't know, it's probably somebody like Brian Bennett or Clem Clutini on drums. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, your dad didn't write that song, though, did he, Guy? Yeah. He wrote Rocky the Cake Man. Yeah. And, and actually, I think I pointed it out to Guy that night. I, I was aware of that. No, but oh, I, right. I love that you were, but, but you did that for a while, um, Glenn. You were a great champion. That's my, my party piece. That. 
I, I, I was part of it, and I love it. It made me very proud. I and know. also, a few years back, I went to a um, Nordoth Robbins thing at some swanky hotel down the Park Lane, and Tim Rice was getting an award, and he was at the next table, and all the way through, and you could ha- have whoever you wanted to sort of nominate and give you the speech for you. And he had Tommy Still. And Tommy Still was at the next table with his back to me. And I was dying to go to speak to him. But I thought I won't interrupt his dinner and all that. And Tim Rice was on last. And then Tommy Still went up to give his speech. He left all he, he had like a couple of carrier bags by his back by his seat. Went up on stage and I thought, well when he comes back, I'll say hello to him. Do you know what? That was the last thing on. He went off backstage with Tim Rice and everybody else. I'm sitting there waiting for him to come. He never came back. I got slung out and he's two bags with it. <laughs> and I thought, what do I do? Do I take his Tesco's bag? Oh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Steele, I've got your cockles in here. <laughs> <laughs> what was in the bag? I don't know. I didn't dare look. You know, it could be anything. Why not? No, oh. come on. That was <laughs> it. It could have been the other half of the sixpence. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh God. So what year is the Hoffner? Um, I think it's about 60, 61, actually, but it's the same style. It's, it's not Tommy Steele's one, obviously. They don't have Tommy Steele's guitar up the Kilburn Eye Road underneath the railway bridge where they sell sort of cheap double basses for the people who go to the music college up there. I don't oh. think Tommy <laughs> Steele's guitar would be there somehow. Well, although that did sound like a line from a Tommy Steele song. Up yeah. the Kilburn Eye Road, aren't it? That's got to an Ian Dury territory now. But, uh, I, yeah. I think We've mentioned Tommy before, but, you know, people who don't know don't realise that he, you know, how important he is in the history of, of, of rock music and, you know, playing down at the Two Eyes and bringing over those records from America That because he was a sailor, wasn't he, buying all those? Yeah, he was a merchant seaman. Yeah. 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 But what's extraordinary is, because the, the history of music, rock music, it's, it, it's really hard to gauge the time of it all because you... You, the Sex Pistols were actually less than 20 years after that. Yeah, you know? Well, yeah, yeah. And that, and, and that was 40 odd years ago now. It's kind of funny, you know. You know no, when it's 80 years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, hang on, sorry, hang Tommy, on. No, sorry. Yeah. No, no, sorry, sorry. Oh, we need a mathematician around here. Yeah, this um, is a strong point. Yeah. No, but also when you're a kid, when you're growing up, I got, I got a theory where you kind of get waves of music. Lots of people listen to music when they're growing up and they're too young to do anything about it. And maybe they might hear their brothers who are a bit older than them or something going on in their neighbourhood. And then when they finally pick up a guitar and then maybe a few years later learn something to do about it, they tend to go back to the music that they first heard. So think about Green Day, right? Punk band, sort of 10 years after, which is the gestation period of punk music coming out. All the two-tone stuff, 10 years after the original kind of blue beat thing going yep. on in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, it was my contribution to punk, but it was kind of 10 years after the swing 60s and all those fantastic, you know, Tamla and Ready Steady Go and the early Kinks and the Arbors yep. and the Who. That's kind of what got me going. But, but you- also in the back of my mind... There was stuff before that. And, you know, when I was a kid, I, there was old cars around, like ja- Javelins. you seen one of them for years? Or Vauxhall <laughs> Vanguard or Austin Somerset. The and Tommy St- Yeah. Tommy St- St- it was a labor. Well, even, be, even, yeah, yeah, even before that. And it, Tommy still fits in with all that kind of stuff. You know, it's that stuff that was just before your time that you was aware of, but you didn't really know too much. About well, well it's, it's true. That, you know, when... when uh, in, in the early 70s, you know, there was that mid 70s, there was that 50s rock and roll, rock, rockabilly kind of revival, wasn't there? Which is Malcolm and Vivian kind of latched on to. Yeah, and Sha Na Na. Um, who else? Oh, yeah. yeah, there was Bra- a big rock and roll revival, wasn't there, Bra- at that time? There was that big, they, they used to have shows at Wembley Stadium. You know, when you first started with the Pistols, one of the songs you were doing was, was No Lip, wasn't it? Which is Dave... Dave Barry's Barry. Thing, yeah. It was a quite obscure B-side. Uh, I don't know, he's, he's, he, but he that was from a, what the, the 60s, I guess. You know, that, yeah, about that, 64, 65. Who, who yeah. decided that that was a song that you guys should do in the band? Um, it was a bit of a collective consciousness. Lots of those songs came from the jukebox that Malcolm had, and we found the B sides a bit more interesting and doable than. The A sides. I mean, it's the B side of the crying game. You can't imagine Johnny Rotten yeah, singing yeah. the crying game, but you could do Don't Give Me No Lip Child, which we changed around a bit. 
And we, we liked all that kind of stuff. I mean, through doing that, I actually got, um, oh, it's so funny. I went to some dude in the early 80s. There was a club called Legends down the bottom yeah, of yeah. Savile yes, Row. I, I think we've yeah. all ended up I, on the floor I, yeah. Legends. <laughs> and and I'd, I, I'd actually done the cover of a song called The Strange Effect, which is another Dave Barry song, right? And Dave Barry was playing. And he had a band, oh, but it was like a real Batley variety club kind of band. And they did a number and it'd take it down to some kind of 70s, you know, boogie kind of thing while he introduced the song. And um, he said, OK, right, I'm now going to do a song which is a big hit for me, big hit for me. And it was also a big alternative hit for a great friend of mine, great friend of mine from the Sex Pistols, Glenn Matlock. I thought, well, I'm quite surprised he's even heard me because I put it out as a little single. So he's signing things after the gig. So I go up to him and I'm like, hello, Dave Aiken, who are you? I said, I'm your great friend. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was great. It was great meeting him. He started sending me a Christmas card every year for about 10 oh. years. Sutton but, Caulfield, he lived we got, We're going to go back a bit further. Yeah, but yeah. I just got to hook onto that, that jukebox that's in, in, in Malcolm and Vivian's shop. Vivian Westwood yeah. shop. Because we were literally just talking about that before. Well, because yeah, go on, go on. You, you, was your, you had the story, didn't it's you? It's my story. <laughs> uh, no, because apparently, because John Johnny Rotten's audition was singing I'm 18, wasn't it? The Alice Cooper song from yeah. the jukebox. In, the, in front of the jukebox, yeah. yeah. But he didn't really sing along very well, but it was something about the way it was a kind of a weird scenario. He was there with his mate and there was us that we'd never met before and we'd all been to the pub and he came back and he, he must have felt very awkward and he just sort of kind of sort of gooned around a bit in quite an interesting way. Because you'd all just been drawn to this shop, right? What was what was the... that was? Well, the... We all independently made our way there. I, I got a job there because I was looking for a job and I got one because I dug it and there was something about the place and all these people started coming and Stephen Paul would come in trying to nick things. It was my job to stop them. <laughs> but you laugh, they did, you know. No, I know, I know that. I, I, I mean, Steve was legendary. He once, the first flat I ever lived in, he came round to visit and someone said, um, someone's bringing Steve Jones around, put your guitar under the bed. Right. Yeah, but that's the first place he'd look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But anyway, the people all came from different things and we all met there, so... No, but I'm, I'm interested in that whole Kings Road scene as well. I think we, 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 we'll dig that out of you in a bit. But where did you grow up? Kensal Green, up the Arrow Road. So not, not far from um, the top of Labrick Grove on the Arrow Road. Go up at Labrick Grove, over the Canal Bridge, turn left, and there's a cemetery on your left. And I lived at the other end of the cemetery. But what was good about it, it was the school I went to, it was half West Indian and half white kids. And it's like in the early 60s, lots of the kids were into music. In the summer, everybody would have their windows open. There'd be all blue beat and scar pumping out. But what kind of, moving on, what kind of music were you into, though, at that time as a kid? I mean, what turned you on? What was the first thing that really went, that's it, that's, that's under my skin? All right, well, my <laughs> uncle was about 10 years older than me and sort of it wasn't really a teddy boy, but had sort of flirted with that. And he gave me his old 78s when he then wanted to look like Anthony Newley and go and he slayed with a white... He did, you know. Right. And if, back, if I, back. Yeah, the white Mac and all the slim Jim tie and drain pipe trousers or one of the Cray twins kind of thing. You know all about that, right? That kind of look. And he gave me his old 78s. So the first records I actually put on were Elvis Presley... Um, Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, Jerry Lee Lewis, not Jerry Lewis. Well, hey! Mate, maybe um, The Big Bopper. There was a record I liked, Chantilly Lace, but the uh, B side, yeah. the B side was Purple People, he's a meat switch doctor, and it's all got sped up vocals like uh, Pinky and Perky kind of thing. So as a kid, I liked that. But then that coincided <laughs> with only two pop programs on the radio. This is before your time, Gary, only just. But there was a pro, there was Jimmy Savile, whose name we shouldn't really mention, played the top 40 on a Sunday. But I always thought as a kid, well, how do you know what a top 40 is if you can't hear any records? You know, to chew, chew this was a fair enough point. And there was a show on Saturday mornings called the Brian Matthews Show. And he used to play comedy clips from like Hancock's Half Hour interspersed with songs, you know, like the Dave Clark Five and maybe the Beatles and stuff like that. And that's when I first started hearing it. And then that coincided with transistor radios coming out. So we all started listening when you went to bed at night with the transistor radio under your pillow, Radio Luxembourg, and then Radio London and um, Caroline stuff started off. You know, that that movie that came out, The Boat That Rocked, which is a yeah, comedy, yeah, yeah. comedy about it, but that was the size of it. But that coincided 
with all the early bands coming through, you know, like the Kinks and the Who and the Arbors and the Stones and the Idol Race and the Small Faces. And then we had the most fantastic pop show ever in the whole world was Ready Steady Go and all those bands would play live. That's what really got me going. You know, it's that three minute epic song, which is hopefully of got some lyrics of some kind of consequence you know it's not just la 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 love songs and ray davis i think or or, or stevie marriott would have written those kind of lyrics so. yeah but yeah. also with that they had dusty springfield on the show and she used to co-host it sometimes and, and then she and was, tons of soul didn't they well, t- well she she brought it into the show yeah. she was hip to stacks and tamla Motown. so as well as that you'd have sam and dave you'd have a junior walker on a martha Reeves and the van Dallas. Like singing like it was fantastic, but you're still where, very where young. Now? Then. You're very young then, aren't you, Glenn? Yeah, we, I was. I was. Uh, yeah, I was about ten, but maybe I had an aptitude for it. It was the best. It was better than Car Fifty Four. Where are you? And how did you end up with a guitar in your hand? Because I wanted one, and I asked for one for Christmas, and I got the probably the cheapest one on the knock from a place in Oldham, which actually somehow has ended up in the vault in the Hard Rock in their kind of little museum thing in Piccadilly. I don't know, I ended up there, I flogged it to somebody a long time ago, and I went down there, and it was there, and I'd taken my kids, well, I'd heard it was there, and I went down, and I took my kids down when they were younger, and it's fantastic. It's actually in an old bank vault in the room. They've got Jimmy Page's Les Paul. They've got a flying V that belonged to um, Jimi Hendrix. They've got Entwistle's bass. They've got Les Paul's number two Les Paul. Wow. All arranged around this safe that looks like the door's been blown off and it's the acoustic guitar that my mum and dad bought me and I couldn't play it <laughs> at, at, at the time. So what I did, I kept trying to tart it up a bit. And once my dad worked at Rolls Royce at the time and he got a load of burl walnut veneer that I covered the top of it with, but I made such a bad job. I had to shave it all off and then it looked a bit plain. So around the sound hole, you know, you have all that nice abalone and, you know, design. Yeah. Nah. Felt tip pen, free end. It's, <laughs> it's dreadful. But the girl who's working there said all the kids come in, they relate to that guitar more than any other one because it's the kind of thing they might end up kind of getting. So Did you write pistol songs on that? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, little yeah bit. we'll say that. We'll say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I did a little bit, but do you know what? It was a plank, and it still is. And they got it out for me, and I went blah, and he went, oh, man, <laughs> dreadful. Cheese, a cheese, a cheese colour. But you went to uh, St Martin's School of Art, didn't you? Did you do fashion there or art? What, what no, did you do? I, I did the foundation course where you do a little bit of everything. And then I got into the degree in fine art painting. I could have been the first Damien Hurst, not the second one. <laughs> but in the summer holidays, I decided to take the pistol seriously. So I went in on the first day of the new term, booked the pistols to play there. And... Um, then went to the bursar's office and said, like, I'm not coming, give my place to somebody else. And I kind of thought they was going to say, oh, Glenn, we need you. And I went, oh, all right then. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? So I had to concentrate on the band. You know. And when did the bass come into it? Oh, well, the, well I said I got the gig in the band because Stephen uh-huh. Paul came in and I had a fledgling band. And they was for some reason, I was always trying to get Malcolm involved and he kind of humoured them. One sa- the Strand, wasn't it? The Strand, their band was called, wasn't it? Right, the Strand at one stage, then the Swankers. Um, this is a long time before John was in the band. There was another guy in the band called Wally. He was quite good, actually. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. Wally Nightingale, who, or Warwick Nightingale, we called him Wally, and he was a bit of a Ron Wood kind of type. But anyway, they come in one Saturday afternoon. I'm making sure they don't nick anything. Malcolm's talking to him, and he said, how's it going with the band, lads? Ho, 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 ho. And Paul said... Well, I don't know, Mel, when we're trying to take it seriously, but the bass player never turns up. And I said, I had a bass for about two months. Then I said, I play bass. And they went, do you? And I said, yeah. And the first question was, what's your favourite band? And I said, the Faces. And they went, that's our favourite band. And that's what got me the gig. But so you already, you say you had a bass for about two months. So why did you got the bass? Before you just decided... Somebody at school. This is right. still when I was at school. Because I worked there Saturdays for me beer money. And... Um, Somebody at school was flogging them, so I thought I'd have a go at it. But, but as you know, guy, you buy a bass guitar, you got no amp, you got nobody else to play with. It's yeah, tell like, me about it. Tell me about it. You know, it's it's kind of what you do. <laughs> you know, the only way you can hear the bass if you ain't got an amp is jam it against the wardrobe or something like that as some big soundboard. So you soon realise you need to play with other people. 
So there was a perfect opportunity. You know, how come you're ending up working in what was one of the hippest shops in Kings Road? Descri describe Kings Road and what what that, what that was, what the, and these key shops that were down there that ended up creating the whole punk scene. Back then, there wasn't all the shops that ended up creating the punk scene. It was the tail end of the the hippie and swung in London. You know, there was like Antiquarius. There was. Um, Great gear market. There was um, Alcacera. As Granny Takes a Trip was gone by then, right? No, that was still there. When I was looking for this shop I'd heard of, I got off the number 11 bus, and there was a shop with... I'd never been down the King's Road before, and there was a car with half a car sticking out of a window, and I thought, well, this might be it. And I went in there, and they were all like, dressed like the Rolling Stones. I thought, well, this ain't it. Because I was looking for a pair of brothel creepers. That Was that Paradise Garage when it had the with the car? No, that was Granny uh, Takes Trip and, okay. and Let It Rock, which was Malcolm's shop. Yeah. That was what was Paradise Garage <laughs> before, right. only he got it for Tommy Roberts. But they were the only two shops, and they were totally the wrong end of the King's Road. You know, most people would go to the, the tube station at Sloan Square, and you'd have to walk all the way along the King's Road to find the interesting bits if you wanted something different. But a few people did want something different. Yeah, But, but what kind of was good for us as a band... We all used to drink in a Roebuck, which not there anymore, became the Dome. But there'd be all these people who like characters out of Budgie in there. You know, and you talk to some bloke who's a bit older and all that. You go, what do you do, mate? He goes, well, I'm a diamond dealer, aren't I? You know, <laughs> you know and then would be the guys from Granny's coming in and Nick Kent was hanging out there and and you'd see um, Anthony Price and, and Brian Ferry sort of strolling up and down the road. It was all that kind of thing. Malcolm all thought they were tossers, so we did too. But that's an incredible sort of uh, mixture, isn't it? A boiling pot of, you know, working class flash and, and, and artsy middle class uh, fashion students and teachers. Yeah, and that's also London at its finest, I think. Yeah, really. exactly. You know, yeah. you know, and that was why I enjoyed going to art college. It was all working class blokes who were having to go do something. And all the girls were debutantes. But just thinking, Guy, what the kind of music that was sort of happening, you know, because punk came along. Also, I wouldn't mind knowing when you first heard that word, that term punk. But, you know, punk came along and it sort of wiped the slate clean for everybody. You know, we were uh, there was there was the whole sort of obviously Eric Clapton, Pink Floyd and Genesis and the prog rock thing going on as well. Sort of American cowboy prog rock stuff. But then it, it punk was really much more connected with glam rock, wasn't it? In, in you know, there, you could see a connection with Roxy Music and, and with Bowie and, and obviously what was going on in America with New York Dolls and Iggy. Well, that, you know, and yes, it, it, glam rock had kind of been and gone. And if it had gone anywhere, it had gone to America to try and make, break the American market. So those bands weren't really around. I saw the Spiders from Mars at Earl's Court, you know, saw the faces at, at Wembley and had no idea who was on but wanted to get me money's worth because back in those days, I had to buy a ticket. There, there was a back, there was this first band on with a pink fairies whose time had kind of been and gone without actually yeah. arriving in the middle. And there was this other band that I'd heard about because Malcolm and Tommy Roberts had been going on about seeing them at Bieber, which I was a bit too young to go to sport band, New York Dolls, the original New York Dolls with Billy Mercer on the drums. About uh, a week before he OD. Yeah, because that was because Malcolm had went to New York and tried to salvage them, didn't he? He'd managed them. I wonder if, but, but that was, but they weren't really part of the uh, New York punk scene, were they? No, they were uh, you know, and don't forget, it's everything us getting together took a couple of 18 yeah. months, two years, and time goes really quickly. Then and Malcolm was going backwards and forwards to the States, and the, he tried to get them back together, and he did that red patent leather look thing with them, which, uh, and then yeah. and then they broke up and they formed the Heartbreakers. Oh, also, so when, actually, going, sorry, I'm really sorry to interject. I'm sorry. Um, um, is that I, I would like to point out the first proper gig I ever had was playing for Sylvain Sylvain. Oh, well, a, there you go. Where was that? I never knew that. Um, it was when he would move to London. He took, I went to Paris and Stockholm with him. And stuff, right. so. Oh, okay, cool. But carry on, sorry. Why, why didn't he, I, I want to know why he didn't ask me. That's a very good question. I, I was probably cheaper. I mean, I was literally, you know. Oh, well, well, whatever is that? <laughs> yeah, Sylvain, Sylvain was going to be, wasn't he going to be the lead singer of the Sex Pistols for a bit? He was going to come over and try out, but it didn't really work. And another guy we had some kind of contact with, and I think the letter went, was Richard Hell, you know, from the Voidos, who'd Malcolm and Matt over there. But all these people, well, maybe the Dolls had, but not Richard Hell or the Ramones we'd heard about. 
nobody had heard rec- had made records at that stage, so we never heard them. So was it you and Steve and Paul uh, in a little rehearsal room without a singer for a bit? For a bit, but originally Steve was a singer, and it was me, Steve, Wally. Now, me, Paul, Steve and Wally, Wally playing the guitar and Steve singing and having a go at playing the guitar. Steve thought he was like Steve Ellis or somebody like that, mixed with Tom Jones. It wasn't <laughs> quite right. <laughs> and was it, were you writing songs by this point, Glenn? Was it? Having a go, but I think a lot of people in bands will probably agree with me this. You think, let's do a cover. So you have a go at doing a cover. And do you know what? Sometimes it's a bit too hard. You know, all those chord things. <laughs> like so you, don't, you don't do the complicated bits. You need a simpler version. And then soon it sounds so unlike what you're trying to play, but actually sounds quite good. You've got your own song. I think that's how most people start writing. That's exactly right. Yeah. You, yeah. you steal at first, don't you? I mean, I remember the first song I ever wrote was basically "I Have a Hammer." I, uh, if I had a hammer, Trini so, Lopez. Yeah. So someone showed me uh, the, this book I had. Show, had the chords of "If I Had a Hammer," and I played those four chords, and I thought, I like the chords, but I really hate the tune. I'm going to write my own tune on that. So you, you kind of borrow, don't you? But what the cover song, the songs you cover are often revealing to your influences. Obviously, one of the songs you did when I saw the Pistols play was uh, was was uh, I'm not your stepping stone. Was stepping, right, yeah. Which is the Monkeys. How did that end up in in your world? Um, I think possibly I think possibly that was Paul's idea to do that one. Possibly because he liked the sort of Tamla drum beat, you know, bah, bah, bah. I don't know, but it kind of fitted in Great somehow and it, and it was quite easy to do. But we probably, even though the monkeys did it, I can't I won't put money on this, but maybe Malcolm had Paul Rivera and the Raiders, Paul Rivera and the Raiders version of it on the jukebox, maybe. And then the monkeys did it. Oh, well, no matter. We'll do a better version than them. But, you know, one of the other things that was going on in the mid to late 60s was the monkeys. You yeah. know, their, their show was fun. It was great. There was nothing wrong with the monkeys. They were a laugh. You know. Yeah, and, and it was all great and, songwriters. And great songwriters. You know, Neil Diamond and all that lot. This is Guy's connection with Pink Floyd. I hate Pink Floyd. I, I saw that at the uh, Pink Floyd show, Guy, that T-shirt. Yeah, no, I saw it. And uh, But well, interestingly enough, because... Um, cause, cause, John was actually a, a big Pink Floyd fan, wasn't he? And, and apparently the rumour is that Sid was called Sid after Sid Barrett. And yeah. um, because someone pointed this out in an interview years later, which because remember back at, in the mid 70s, T-shirts were a big, big deal, right? You took it seriously. You had to send off somewhere in the back of the enemy, some address in Newcastle, and you waited three weeks for your T-shirt. Yeah. So when someone, some journalist finally said to John, but you did have a Pink Floyd T-shirt. And he said, yeah, I'm amazed it took you so long. Of course, I love Pink Floyd. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. But I think but there, there was always that T-shirt, wasn't there? That big fat bloke saying sod off to some little guy. Flying <laughs> United, making bacon. Is it true that, 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 that John wrote, I hate, over the yeah. top of that T-shirt? And that's why someone spotted him and thought he's going to be perfect. Um, I don't know if it was because of the T-shirt, but I do know he wrote on it. But I think he probably wrote on it on joining a punk band that maybe it wasn't the coolest thing. So it was some, right. ki- some kind of smoke screen, you know, uh, but I do remember. Cookie who wore on top of the pops, wasn't it? Cookie well, wore it well, yeah, I mean, look at the who, how many pictures of, of the who are there? Well, one of them's got the union jacket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but John with his felt tip pen, I remember we did the marquee. In fact, I was talking to Nigel the other day, he's doing a book about the Nigel Hutchins about his time at the Marquee. And when we played there, we did the sound check. I went to the loo roundabout, come back out, and said, hey, guys, somebody's written the Sex Pistols on the wall. And John went, yes, it was me. <laughs> I said, oh, you're not a wall writer, are you? And he opened this thing, and he's got all different coloured felt-tip pens. <laughs> I, I do think Sex Pistols, though, is one of the greatest band's names ever. Where did the name come from? Because it's so good. Basically, by that time, Malcolm Shop was called Sex, and with a pink sign, which I up made, which was supposed to be like a Rauschenberg's soft sculpture, but we run out of foam padding, so it kind of petered out a little bit. But we we, we were the pistols from the sex shop, the Sex Pistols. So, of course, there you go. Of course, Malcolm had a few ideas for, mate, for some names. One of them was the Damned, which the Damned ended up being called. Guess what? The Dam. You know, we had another band, Creme de la Creme which was rubbish. Kid Glad Love, which was another thing he came up with, but we liked the Sex Pistols thing. So that was it. 
And then how much influence was there from him with the songs? I mean, with the none, none. Yeah, not even <laughs> not even in the titles or anything. Now, they one, 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 one song he come up. We was rehearsing at the Roundhouse for some reason before we got our own rehearsal place, and it was the the crossover period be, between getting rid of Wally and having our own place, and um, it was a bit of a schlep. The me, I, I went with John and Stephen Paul didn't turn up. So me and him went into the pub over the road and he said, are you saying Malcolm? And I said, yeah. And he said, anything to say? And I said, not really. I said, oh yeah. He said he had an idea for a, a song. And John goes, what is it? And I said, submission. And he went, what, like all bondage and, and domination and all that. And I went, yeah. And he went, oh. And then one of us said to the other, how about a submarine mission? So we sat in the pub <laughs> and traded line by line each. And it was really about taking the mickey out of Malcolm. And then I went home and worked some calls out. And next time we actually did Rias, we worked it up as a band. And that was it. That's how that came about. That's about the only time we actually sat, song we actually sat and co-wrote together. And what about the lyrics for Anarchy? Was that actually, was that something that John came up with? Was he in, was he, did he understand that sort of stuff? Was that what was going on in his head? Or was that Malcolm as well? There was quite an interesting bunch of people around. There was Malcolm and Vivian. Bernard Rhodes, who was around in the early days, who went on to manage Clash, mm -hmm. and Jamie Reed, who's kind of pretty right on with his politics and stuff. He did all the artwork, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, he'd also been quite an, of an activist kind of thing. Malcolm told me, I don't know how true it is, but, like, in the early 70s, when credit cards had just come out, and remember, there was MasterCard, there was another one that didn't last. But, you know... Dinos was a... No, there was another um, English one. I forget what it was. Um, I, I should remember because I got the sack from it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I used to have a little, like, a credit card, you know, with the corners are slightly rounded off, and they put them in shop windows, you know, this card's accepted here. But he did one, and he got all his mates to go along Oxford Street and put it on the door, like, before the shops opened, and it said, looking like a diner's club card or something else, but it was some, actually something else saying, this store welcomes shoplifters. And they all went in shoplifting and got stopped. And they said, well, it says on the door, look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know whether they were trying to get away with it or whether it was a laugh, how true it was, or whether well, it was some kind of like, um, you know, agit prop kind of thing going on. Right, yeah. But save petrol, already... yeah, save petrol, burn cars is another sticker he used to put around, wasn't it? It was during yeah. the oil crisis. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> So basically, from sitting around in a pub, I'm sure John picked up some ideas. And when I when I saw you guys play, and I was there, and I've said it before. <laughs> where where the did he see us, and did I you pay to get in? Screen on the green. I did pay. To, well, actually, do you know what? I didn't pay to get in. I was, oh. And I tell you why, because Stephen Woolley was was the uh, assistant manager at the Screen on the Green, and he he went to our school, and he just Is that a skinny the skinny bloke. No, he he's, he went on to become one of the main producers of Palace Pictures, and he made Mona Lisa as and that's oh. the Brian game was in there. Is that right? Have I got that right? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, amazing con connections, and um, <clears throat> and and Roger. No, that's the I, I'm thinking. Roger of. was the manager. Anyway, yeah. Steve Woolley worked there, and Steve said to us, "You got to come down. The Pistols are playing. Clash, Buzzcocks, come along." That's how I ended up knowing about it. So I think I might have been on the guest list, even though I was 16. And I've listened back recently to the recording of that show because it was such a seminal moment in my life. I mean, literally, Glenn, you changed my life that night because I was in a terrible band before and I, and I, and I went straight into rehearsals the next day. I went, I'm leaving. And we, me and Steve Norman, who were at that gig with Steve Dagger, went into school in September and formed what became the band that I was successful with. But it was like an art piece. I remember thinking now, I think about it, it was like an installation. If you listen to the recordings, you play a song. It was amazing. And then there's nothing. There's like a few people like going like this. But the Bromley contingent were at the front taking the piss. And it was the weirdest show I'd ever seen. It was like you were, everyone was being ironic, sarcastic, catty. I mean, they were, but I mean, in the end, it turned into mad shows with people jumping up and down going crazy. But at the beginning, it was an art piece. I, well, I can't. And, and there was something about like John, but... the way he did it. John, the way he would sneer at the audience and the way they would sneer back at him. The, 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 the crowd at the, at the beginning. I, I think he did that initially because he was probably quite shy, you know, and it was like an act to kind of give him a bit of Dutch courage somehow to hide behind. You know, like Bowie always says that he didn't want to be a singer, he wanted to be an actor and he portrayed a role. It's some of it 
maybe good. Some of it's kind of bollocks, maybe. But, you know, I think he sort of adopted this persona, which kind of stuck. But just going on, you saying that Steve and Woolley be going on to become this and somebody else going, that's what I liked about the punk thing. Nearly everybody who was in that initial coterie of about 25 people all went on to do something of some kind of consequence in their own particular yeah. field. The very first gig we played at was St. Martin's, but the very first one I'd actually booked, although it turned out was going to be after that, I wandered into Central School of Art, looking a bit lost in all my rocket, let it rock gear when everybody had long hair and great coats. And these two guys said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for the social secretary. And the littler one said, well, I am. And then the, the bigger guy said, no, you're not. I am, and you're my assistant. And they started bickering, right, who was that? And I'm going like, uh, you know, I'm looking for... But those two guys, one was Sebastian Conran, who now or was for a bit, was <laughs> running the Conran Empire, and he was at um, uh, uh, Central doing ergonomics. The other guy, still a big mate of mine, was Al McDowell. He was in England last year, called me up, said, what are you doing over here? He said, I'm at Pinewood. I said, what are you doing? And he was an art director in Star Wars 9. <laughs> wow. He's the first person to book the Sex Pistols, except but- I didn't do Star Wars 9 because the script was based on Carrie Fisher, who promptly died, and then I was all stuck. But the real gig, um, Greg, the one that is absolutely mind-blowing, is, is Manchester, isn't it? Where there was what they said, so there was 15 people there, but those 15 people were Ian Curtis, Stephen Morrissey, Johnny Marr, um, Mick Hucknall, I mean, every single person in that audience went on to do something enormous. Yeah, so, so I've heard, but I mean, I don't didn't really do know it. who was who at the time, you know. Yeah. But it was funny, that was about 10 years ago, I was playing my all-time favourite band, The Faces, which is kind of funny because the world went full circle because it was a band that got me the gig in the Pistols in the first place. But I still go to a few art school things and... Um, I went to a talk with um, Kevin Cummins and Paul Morley and some other bloke who was there talking about doing the artwork for the factory records things and all that. And then somebody at the end, at the back of the audience, put their hand up, any questions, and said, yeah. They said, who was there at the first Sex Pistols gig? Nobody knew I was there. And they had a little conflab on the stage. And the only person they could really agree on, because he went through everything, you know, the opening of an envelope, was McUcknell, who I was actually playing with in the face. It was, it was kind of funny. <laughs> I was like, um, um, if I just tell a story, I, I was one, once asked Chris Spelling, because it's always made me laugh, like that when you played the punk festival at the 100 Club, and this is the gig that there's, there's like 50,000 people at least in this country who say they were there, right? Mm. It's, it's like, oh yeah, I saw the pistols at the 100 Club. And I asked Chris, because of course Chris was on the bill, Right, who, who, and he produced your demos, of course, legendary guitarist Chris Spedding. And I said, so Chris, what was it? How many people were actually at the punk festival? And he said, well, when the pistols went on, probably about 15. When they came off, quite a few less. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. One, one, of the, one of the sort of, this isn't a criticisms, but one of the pieces of the myth is that, you know, that you guys were put together by Malcolm to, to sell his clothes. Did, did, was there a feeling, was there an element of that? in it i mean you looked amazing i mean that was the other the appeal of the sex pistols were the was the clothes you were wearing you couldn't buy them anywhere they just they were the they were the best looking things i'd ever seen um well no it's it, it, that it's, that's the side of it's true but he didn't put us together to sell his clothes we wanted to form a band we met in his clothes shop which we went there because we liked the clothes in it so we kind of took from him it was it was a very symbiotic relationship mm. They were very expensive know. clothes as well. They was, they? And they were expensive. It was a designer you know. shop. <laughs> yeah, it was a designer. Paul always says designer punk, and we were, you know. <laughs> but so, but you, you carried it off. I mean, the the pizzazz on stage was was always amazing, and and you know that, and I always, you know, Johnny doing his sort of mad Uriah Heap kind of thing that he did was was extraordinary and 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 steve was a guitar hero in fact i remember when i saw you that day and he had guitar hero written across his his no 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 it was guitar nero was it was it yeah (laughs) i never knew that guitar hero yeah it looks like hero fiddling fiddling while rome burns fretting while rome burns says nero you know (laughs) but you were the tunesmith though uh, Glenn, I mean, you were coming up with, you know, you know, listening to that that 
album now the one thing that stands out is the quality of the songs you know this wasn't a lot of bands came out of the punk movement and thought you just had to play things really super super fast and sing i don't wanna every now and again but it was it was there was it was a slower sound and it was i mean extraordinary sound from in the production of the guitar but the tunes that that how did that work relationship work in the group if nobody had done what they did on the records, it wouldn't sounded like what it sounded like. Mm -hmm. But there's a demarcation dispute, you know, and I would bring an idea in and we'd knock it around and then spits would come in and then you kind of... I used to like getting Steve to play what I was playing on a bass and once he'd done his bit and got it down, I would try and do something different as a counterpoint kind of thing. But I think my talent in the band was because I liked all those 60s music, you know, songs that kind of hang together as little kind of mini operas. I think I, I provided a vehicle for John's nutty lyrics, but, but, but he that's didn't. But he didn't write all the lyrics, you know, it's like pretty vacant. That's my song, you know, I, I wrote that. Um, Submission we co-wrote, 17 was Steve's song originally, which John changed around a little bit, but he did write Anarchy in the UK Words and he did write... God Save the Queen, which was originally called No Future, but then it dawned on somebody it was going to tie in with the Queen's Silver Jubilee. So they changed the title. All of the words were always exactly the same. But it must, I'd be interested to know um, what your melodies were like before John got his hands on them. Um. <laughs> because, I, I mean, unless you, know, I, unless you were sort of specifically writing for it, knowing that he was going to do his whole... Well, I, you know, I, you know, I did the pretty bacon song, and he did his version of it, kind of thing. But I would leave the top line thing to him, and then make suggestions when it weren't kind of cutting it. A lot of things we rehearsed in this tiny little room, which was not much bigger than this room. Oh, I was in Denmark Street, right? You had that place, yeah, like yeah, because yeah. that must yeah. have been pretty wild as well. Because that was another little real microcosm, isn't it? All the guitar shops and all the publishing companies. Yeah, and there, there was all people like. Um, Who's that guy who did music is my first love? John Miles. Yeah, he was always in the guitar shop, possibly. <laughs> Good luck to him, but hanging out, you know, but it was all people like that. And then there was us, these urchins, you know, and it, it was... But the legends that have sprung out of that now, because I know that when I was in, I was in one of the shops in Denmark Street, I think it's around the back of No Tom uh, that's there now, vintage guitar shop. And, and I was taken into that rehearsal room. And it was like walking into the Sistine Chapel. There was graffiti on the wall. And we were all wondering, now, could that be original? Could could <laughs> Steve and, or John have done that? You know, and it was... Well, it, they are. They are. And I, I actually saved that for the nation because I had the place back again in the early 80s. And I got fed up with that stuff. I wanted to change. So what I did is I wallpapered it over nicely. But you know, with that anaglypse of embossed paper you get in pubs that you paint over? yeah. And just papered oh, yeah. over, okay. papered over the whole thing for a, for um, you know, just for a chain. And then I went back there about ten years ago when my kids were littler because I knew the blokes in the guitar shop. Showed them out the back, and there was some. I think Margaret Howell had an office there or something like. That. And I said it's exactly the same. And they said, "Oh no, we're going to decorate it soon." And I said, "Well, I tell you what." If you peel the wallpaper off very, very gently, you'll be very surprised. There's all these Johnny Rotten cartoons all over the place. Right. No. Anyway, they did it. And that's it. And when they was trying to save Denmark Street, that was one of the reasons that they managed to keep some of the things. It's kind of like grade two listed now. That's brilliantly forward thinking of you, Glenn. You must have to save it for the nation. Well, there you go. When did you realise? I'm that kind of guy. When did you realise you weren't just a band? You were part of the whole movement? Oh, right, right before we even picked up an instrument, I think. You know, we was hip. That, that, down that end of the King's Road, we did a song before it came out. We did Roadrunner by Jonathan Richmond and oh, Michael yeah, Lovers. Right, right. But we did it because Malcolm was mates with Nick Kent, who was mates with the people at Crony Takes a Trip, and one of them used to go in there was John Cowell, who produced the Modern Lovers album, and it hadn't come out yet. And John Carroll had given Nick Kent a cassette with half the album on it, which he gave to Malcolm, which gave gave to us. The record hadn't even come out. And we thought, what's this song all about? It's so weird. We didn't even realise it was about a car. But it's just, <laughs> it had this weird and crazy kind of song. Nobody had heard of Jonathan Richmond, and he was doing his song pretty much from the get-go, just because we was in the hippest place at the time. Steve Jones now says that, um, or has said, that the two worst things that happened to the pistols was you leaving 
and uh, and doing the Bill Grundy show. So for anyone who doesn't know, because the Bill Grundy show was so shocking. I mean, Bill Grundy, what time was he on, Guy? I don't even remember. What kind of a, it was what, six o'clock. It, it was uh, straight after the news, wasn't it? Yeah, about 6.15, it started. It, it was the, you had, B, you had Nationwide on BBC One, and then you had, uh, was it Thames Today? What was it? Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a London local news program. Yeah. It was like the one show, wasn't it, with a with a grumpy Grundy? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. And they, they had the Sex Pistols. I mean, what were they thinking? Having the Sex Pistols on that show? Well, yeah, yeah, but they, yeah, but we, Queen cancelled, wasn't it? Queen Queen cancelled. Yeah. We got it at the last minute. We nearly didn't do it because we was rehearsing for the Anarchy tour. And in fact, I took a phone call in this place up in Oldham. There was an old cinema there, and. Um, Nils, who was working for Malcolm, said, oh, you've got a TV show, we're going to send a limo. And we go, no, no, we're busy. You know, and I was sort of like <laughs> being the band lead, you know, we're busy, we have to rehearse, and we're not doing it. Ten minutes later, there's another phone call. Rah, rah, rah. No, we're not doing it. We're in the middle of doing the set. Ten minutes later, Malcolm says, you know, we just signed to an MI. Malcolm says, if you don't do it, you're not getting your wages this week. So we get in the car and we go there and we're there <laughs> to do this, this thing. And... Um, I've said this before, it's kind of common knowledge, but we get there, we get ushered into the green room. Steve, it's winter, everybody's got coats on. Steve Jones is in and out the green room like Flynn with something under his coat. Me, John, Paul, Malcolm go in there, find those little, you know, remember those 33 centiliter cans of Heineken? Yeah, yeah. Or Carlsberg. Well, those ones. Yeah, to, yeah, 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 but they, were, like they, were, they weren't even half a pint, you know. <laughs> so we had them. And next thing we're on the set. What Steve's gone and done, he went in the first, he found a bottle of Blue Nun. He's gone in another room and he's drunk the whole thing himself, right? <laughs> and then we're on the tally. <laughs> Halfway through this interview, which is going a little bit tits up anyway, the Blue Nun kicks in. And Steve starts swearing his head off. None of it was planned. Behind the cameras, Malcolm's going, oh, no, you've done it now. When we come off after all this, you know, the shenanigans, I went to go back in the green room to see if they'd restocked it. Malcolm, he said, where are you going? I said, I want another drink. He said, no, come on, let's get out of here. Just as well as he did, because as we got in the car, a black Mariah turned up, and they all got out with their truncheons to go in. We were sort of waved. They didn't know it was us. So they said that Black Mariah because someone said fuck on television. That is amazing. That's yeah. the seventies for you. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, because even when um, was it in the Great Rock and Roll Swindle in in the film, they had to have that blacked out. You, even in the uh, early eighties, you still couldn't show that well, at all. It was completely yeah. banned. Mind you, I think that's where it all started going wrong. We probably wouldn't have had Brexit if Stephen mate. <laughs> what was it like waking up the next morning then to that to those well i went out that night and got drunk and i kind of forgot oh. but I, I think that night i ended up at dingles i can't remember who it was on i had a skin full phones ringing i had a flat in chiswick phones ringing and sophie who was malcolm's secretary said you better come in to manchester square and i said why she said you'll find out and my head's banging i'm thinking oh. and i got the bus so i was the last one there because I had to come from Chiswick. And there was a girl I used to see who was quite sort of good looking. And it was one of those things, one day you're going to talk to her. And I think it was Katie Manning, who, who was a Bond girl at the time. And I was okay. waiting to get on a bus and she gave me such a dirty look. And I thought, I thought, what's going on? And as I got on the bus, I'm thinking, yeah, it's all starting to come and piece it together in my head. And I thought, hmm. And then when I got to Manchester Square, all the other guys were hanging out the window like the Beatles picture. And there's a gauntlet of press photographers there. And I thought, oh, yeah, the Bill Grundy show. Because <laughs> it, was, it was the filth and the fury. It was all over the papers the next day, wasn't it? I mean, that's Yeah, the, I, hadn't, I hadn't even seen them at that stage. I hadn't, bought, I hadn't had time to pick up a paper. You know. in, in the same way that in the, in the 60s, you know, the Rolling Stones were the bad boys, you'd become the bad boys. And that made every boy want to buy your records, right? It was, it was great. Yeah, that's so, fine. I don't know why, John, why Steve says he thinks it's one of the worst things that happened. Because it was the beginning of the end. I think John changed after that, as soon as he had his boat race on the front page of all the papers. I I thought it was all kind of funny, you know. I was been accused of being, you know, not up for it, but I thought it was, I thought it was the whole thing was funny. But, but then we did the anarchy tour, and that became a different matter because we weren't allowed to play anywhere. We still had to turn up in, in case we could play, and then there was a whole thing to do with, you know, censorship, and, and it was. You know, the anarchy is supposed to be really exciting, but it was boring, really. You know, we couldn't go out the room. 
or out the hotel and press everywhere. It's just something you're not prepared for. And all the little factions within the band kind of started really coming to the fore. And then for me, it became a different thing. You know, that's when Malcolm came into his fore. The day before the Bill Grundy show, he would have to call up the newspapers or the music press to write about us. And the day after the Bill Grundy show, they were calling him. That was the difference. And then it became Malcolm's baby. And every time there was an interview, instead of an interview with a band, it would be Malcolm talking. That's right. I mean, yeah, that's, you know, yeah, that's, I, who, I, that's who you saw. That's right. I, I got the ump about that. And then we was banned everywhere. And then I'd go out to, to see some band a gig and a promoter come up to me and go, hey, Glenn, you know, we'll put you on. Tell Malcolm. So I'd go and tell Malcolm. And he'd go, no, no, you're banned. You know, and it kept happening all the time. And I, that, there was a dishonesty to it that, I didn't think, I, and I joined a band because I wanted to be a musician. I want to, sorry, because I think we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time. I've, there's a story that I heard about you, which I've been telling for years, and I will now finally find out whether or not it's true, which is I heard that years ago, at your, you were living in Maida Vale, I think at the time. Still, a party, am. still oh, am. Okay. Party night at your house, and apparently your, your Never Mind the Bollocks gold or platinum record fell off the wall, yeah. and, the, and the frame smashed, but the record didn't. Yeah. And so you decided to play it to see what it actually was. Yeah, because and apparently it's tubular. Hang, 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 oh. Yeah, hang on, no, hang on. No, because before it fell off the wall, I've been looking at it for years, and it didn't look quite right. And it didn't look quite right because there was no bigger gaps between the tracks. <laughs> so I thought, is my chance? The the thing's broken. It didn't break, but it kind of crashed and it slipped out of the bottom of the frame. So I thought, put it on, and yes, it was tubular bells. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> You left the band before that album came out. You played on nearly all the album as well, didn't no, you? No, I don't play on the Steve plays on all of but they're my songs, you know. That's the that's the thing. I don't so, play how many tracks do you play on? on not, not that many, but I'm on Anarchy, you know, that's the main kind of thing. Just, I don't I, I don't like the bass yeah, playing on the album. The, it that's, like actually the only, that's actually the only one that's got any movement in the bass, because all yeah, the ones yeah. play, but Steve, cause Steve just doubles his guitar part, doesn't he? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to hear my bass playing, you should listen to the spunk tapes. That's my Right. Or, the, or the live stuff, you know. It, it, you know, how did it feel for you? And, you know, what caused the breakup? You know, for me, and I'm being absolutely, it's not because you're here, I, I never bought the Sex Pistols with Sid. It just seemed like a cartoon. No. Uh, but you were the genuine band. And why, why did you? I, I would say this now, but I could see that coming. That was the way it was going, to be like a punk rock Bay City Rollers kind of thing. Yeah, well, it was just headlines. It was just a big, big as soon as Sid was there, yeah. it was just about yeah. headlines. And yeah. I would I would say this, but I don't think Malcolm ever understood that we were any good. He really thought we was rubbish. And he thought he was sort of he was the bloke who was selling London Bridge, you know. But we could play and and I wanted to be in a band to play music. Why I like leave? I like that side of it. Pardon? Why did you did you leave or what was the what was the true story behind that? Well, I've I've just said really it was coming to a head. I didn't like the way it was going. It was no longer a band where everybody had an equal say, and I felt I wasn't being backed up. And I thought they was being daft. Now you say Steve says you know getting rid of Glenn was the thing, but I walked. You know my position became sort of untenable. But if I'd been backed up by Stephen Paul a bit more. It wouldn't have been, but they didn't. They didn't say that. And it's taken all this time for them to realise. So I think we would never have done 10 albums. And can you imagine Johnny Rotten doing the Sex Pistols, but, you know, our Angie. Angie, Angie. We'll back. It was never going to happen. <laughs> but we could have made another two or three albums, I think. You know. And what was it like when you got back together? It was different because we was grown up. We didn't have to sit on the equipment in the back of a full transit with no windows. <laughs> And we were flying first class between big gigs, not even necessarily on the same flight, not even necessarily on the same day. And we could afford to come to an accommodation with each other. And so we made it work, you know. That sounds like it wasn't personally a great deal of fun. <laughs> it was all right, you know, yeah. but that, that was coupled with doing three nights at the Budokan, you know. Yeah. And meeting your mates in Tokyo or going to Santiago in Chile for the first time or... You know, being the toaster. In fact, one of the best things I remember was we played Roseland Ballroom in um, New York. Did two nights there. One night, normally the mix, the, the on stage mixing desk was on my side side of the stage, but for some reason it was on the other side of the stage that night. There was supposed to be nobody on the stage, 
And they're certainly not on my side because the mixing desk was the other side. And we're doing a couple of numbers. And I thought, there's somebody be behind a PA stack nah, in the gloom, right? I thought, nah. So I finished one number and I looked, somebody there. So I went over and there's two people there. And you know it was? Uma Thurman and Dennis Hopper. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, yes. <laughs> Uh, we can't let you go without talking about the rich kids. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, I, well, Gary, of course, has played with you. but uh, it, 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 He's an honorary member, yeah. I love the rich kids. That was so the perfect sound. And why it didn't become the biggest band in the country, I do not know. It's because Midge and Rusty wanted to wear silly hats. <laughs> <laughs> and become Gary Neuromantic. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, your I, fault, I, Gary. I wanted to be a rock and roller. You know? <laughs> I thought that band was, was fantastic to look at, visually amazing. Then you started to grow your hair. You got Steve News, this incredible young guitarist who, who's androgynous looking in his little red beret. I mean, it was all the glam rock sort of traits that I loved. And, and Mac, uh, Mac from the Faces play. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah which was a connection there. I like what wearing Gary played with us. I, I, was, I thought it was very sweet and I was quite touched about this. When he's rehearsed and you said, Gary said to me, he said, you know what, Glenn? He said, me doing this must have been what it was like for you playing with the faces. And I thought, oh, bless you. It really uh, was. Yeah, it really yeah. was. Oh, he's blushing, look. <laughs> It really was. Although, you know, that, it was a shame we only did the one. The, well, we did two shows. We did one for Steve New when he was still, which I jumped up on stage really yeah. enjoyed you, uh, just before he died. And then, and then, and then I had the honour of replacing Steve for that one show. Uh, yeah, and you could have done the other one we did, but we couldn't get hold of you. Oh, and they Lex did it. Rich Kids for me were a kind of they were the stepping stone, if you like, into into the 80s in many ways. I think well, you... I, I think that. I'm, I'm glad you say that. I think we came out a bit before our time. I think we should have waited. You know, and the reason I did the Rich Kids, it would have been very easy for me to form another punk band and be like a second division Sex Pistols or, or you know, Chelsea or something like that. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something different. That's why I purposely got Midge in the band. I tried out loads of other people first, but I wanted somebody who could sing, you know. And he had a very distinctive voice, great singer. Um, and I kind of wanted to try and put the cat amongst the pigeons. But I remember I then after that, I played with Iggy Pop and we went to Paris. And then we got taken out by the record company to, um, I think we played at La Palace in there. And Malcolm McLaren turned up because he was living in the Paris at the time and freeloaded a mill. And I didn't really want him around, but you can't really get rid of Malcolm. And Iggy <laughs> didn't realise I didn't want him there. But Malcolm said to me, he said, where you went wrong with the rich kids, Bruce? And this is quite a good point. He said, it's all very well trying to be looking forward and doing something new in London where punk had been around for quite a while. But when you played out of London, you know, going up north and things like that, kids who were only still just getting into punk thought yeah. you was taking away from them what they'd only just discovered. No. And that's kind of quite a good point. I hadn't thought of that. So I think if we'd waited a bit, even Ronson said, you know, he said you've got good half you've got a good half an album. And I think it should have been mainly like the first side. Because Mick Ronson produced you, didn't he? He did, you know, but what we was listening to between gigs and stuff, we just listened to Lowe and The Idiot and Heroes and Lust for Life over and over. I should think, apart from Bowie, obviously, we was the first band to ever use a, a harmonizer on the drum. And, but, and what's this year? What's it been like for you not playing any gigs now, Glenn? It's just is what it is, really. You know, I've been doing a few things, been writing. It's a bit frustrating. I made an album which I finished with Slicks playing on it and a few other people. Um, just before lockdown, and we were talking to some companies about getting out, but everybody I talked to wants a tour to go with it, and there's no tours to be had just yet. So yeah. it's just sitting in the balance. But now I've been writing, got back to writing. We did a few online things. Slick got stuck here, which was interesting. You know, everybody was doing, like, online gigs, and we did a few. We was talking about but of course, never got it together because we're like the odd couple, you know. I'm, this is old Slick, who used to be Bowie's yeah. guitar as well. Yeah, but he's basically like Walter Matto, and I'm the Jack Lemon. <laughs> in, instead of doing an online gig, and my flat needed painting. He offered to help me do it, you know, for his boarding lodging, and I thought it would be quite funny to put some overalls on. Me and him up the ladder arguing and have a live stream on YouTube about it, but it, it was like one of those all talked, but I wish we'd done it now. <laughs> All right, one last question. You're a bit of a punk rocker. You've been a rich kid. Now you're a saucer full of secreter. Why have you got a theremin right behind your left ear? <laughs> I have got a theremin by me. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's, uh, I might dig that out on the next uh, Sourceful tour. Who knows? There's, a, there's a little um, art gallery opposite, you know, the Soho, the, the, what's it, Street Fire Station, you know, the fancy restaurant thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chilton, so, Street Fire, Chilton Street Firehouse. Yeah. Opposite there is a little gallery, and I know the bloke. And I went there with Slick maybe two years ago, and he has odd kind of outsider art things and all that. But he actually had a recital by the granddaughter of the bloke who invented the theremin. Wow. And it, and it was great. And we all had to sit around and we, and it was round and we couldn't sit too close. And she made slick move because if she got too close within the force field, <laughs> it would have affected the tuning. So he didn't take too kindly to that, but he sat on the hearth of the fireplace and she ended up, she played some really weird sort of dissonant Russian stuff. And then she played, um, Libro Tango. Da, 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 I'm, I'm more of sort of Jimmy Page throwing just throwing shapes on it, really. I think that's oh, cool. you know. Yeah, not learning anything. Not learning anything. <laughs> Glenn, it, Glenn, thank you for coming on. Thank yeah, you. Brilliant. Glenn, it, I mean, that, 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 thanks for asking us. Um enjoyed it. It's always good talking about yourself. Yeah. Could have been, <laughs> could have been could have been so much more. I still this the yeah. pistols are still the enigma they ever were. Well, there you go. But there's more where that came from. So maybe another time. But when Absolutely. you're so full in secrets, I still haven't seen you because I've always been gigging elsewhere so let me know if you do get it together we again. absolutely will because i want to i want to hear you guys go down 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 we do that dun, dun, dun. that's my favorite oh, we're, we're playing in the we're playing in the uk next uh, what is that april next right? april yeah april and all of this horrible stuff will all be gone we'll all be vaccinated well that was glenn yes yeah i mean listen to play in the pistols is you know this is there, there aren't many bands i mean they are probably you know you'd go the beatles the rolling stones david bowie you would then go the sex pistols wouldn't you you would put it'd be on that your first hand yeah it's an absolute cron it's an absolute time stamp and what a pleasure to talk to him yeah no lovely lovely man um oh and i do envy you having played with the rich kids i will say that because they were they were to me they were they were the perfect sound for that time i thought that's where i thought that's where everything was going to go he said neil x played in the second gig and i didn't even know that he said you you weren't around but Maybe, did I get that message? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I did. Um, scream, scream at your manager. Anyway, listen, thank you for listening. And please, uh, please subscribe. Thanks for all your reviews. And thank you to Ben, our producer. Um, and thank you to ourselves, right? I don't know. Who else do we thank, Guy? I have no idea. Uh, well, obviously, our spiritual advisor. Yes, of um, And yes. Uh, and, no, and thanks to all of you. And thanks to everyone who's keeping the wheels turning in these dark times. We're back next week with, a, with another massive rocker. Well, you, you keep your massive rocker to yourself, love. Um, <laughs> all right, it's good night from me. And it's good night for all, all of them. <laughs> <laughs>